thank you guys all for having this panel. I think it's really important to talk about why women, heart centers for women are important. So Dr. Coulter, tell us what, if you could sum up, why do you think heart centers for women need to exist? Well, when I founded the center about, I guess, 11 years ago, maybe 12, it's running past me, I had three real big guideline focuses. I wanted to increase awareness through outreach and education among the physicians because, you know, quite honestly, many women only see their gynecologist as their primary care doctor. I had a consult this week from a gynecologist and I went in to see the room and the lady was like this normal healthy lady and her LDL was 170. And the the OB guy said, I don't know how to treat that. You better go see the cardiologist. So we still get that. Um, I was interested in obviously um, looking at specialized um, disease entities that were really manifest in women like SCAD and FMD and even HEFPEF, honestly. I was interested in centralizing databases for research purposes. And I was interested in teaching all you young people about that. And so um, the really fulfilling thing is to see how much it's grown. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sitting here alone anymore. Um, I have people that come to see us for real reasons. Um, we have a busy clinic, and so it's grown. That's great. And Dr. Barron, I'm sure, you know, being women in, in cardiology or in surgery is often um, a, a little bit of a zebra, like we like to say. Unicorn. Um, a unicorn. Purple, I like that. A purple unicorn. Um, <laughs> It's a unicorn, but you know these diseases that you mentioned, SCAD and FMD, are also unicorns. Yeah, um, those are unicorns. And you can't find unicorns or zebras if you're not looking for them. So your outreach and your education are super important. Um, so thank you. What do you think, um, as far as bringing women into a women's center, how do you think that affects our ability to recruit into clinical trials? Because, like as you know, like right now, the biggest issue we've got is that we don't have enough data to know what the right answer for women is. So. I had a background in clinical trials before I came to THI, and so I can tell you, like from personal experience, one, getting women to enroll in clinical trials is exceedingly difficult. They're more afraid to join clinical trials. So unless you make it a focus to recruit women, you're not going to recruit women. So having a focused research group where we're interested in women's health um, is, I think, super important. I know, Lauren, that you're a PI or <laughs> helping to organize a big trial looking at cardiovascular grafting right. in women for arterial conduits. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So we know that um, in, well, in the general population, men and women, if you give people more than one arterial grafts, they last longer. The issue is that when in the studies, when we divide it out by gender, we don't actually have enough women in the, in the studies to have a definitive answer on whether or not treating women the same as treating men is the right thing to do. And so uh, for the first time ever in the history of ever, um, the Roma women's trial is going to look at having enough women to statistically answer the question of whether or not women should be getting multiple arterial grafts or whether they should be getting something different from men. And that's sort of um, a departure from what we've generally accepted is that if it's good for men, it's good for women. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. And even in you know general cardiology, but especially in interventional cardiology, um, that's funny because historically, you know, women were thought not to have cardiovascular disease or you know carotid or, or coronary artery disease, which is hilarious <laughs> that it took you know decades for us to finally realize that women are not just men. You know, <laughs> later women have the same problems that men have, and they manifest in different ways. Um, well, Bree and I have a patient in the hospital right now, so as soon as we finish here, we're going to run up and take care of her. So we have a young woman who had absolutely no coronary calcification, who'd been ignored, who'd been to multiple centers. She had classic angina. She had prox LAD. Yeah. So she got stented. She also has vasospasm around her prox LAD stent. So, I mean, she's complicated. So when she comes into the ER, you know, People don't know what to do with her, so. Yeah, and it's. Um, and sometimes we don't know. Exactly. <laughs> so. And you know, we have to all, you know, we have to recognize, all of us physicians have to recognize our own biases, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, identifying that patient might be harder for some people who have biases that are hard to change about women's heart disease. So, Well, it's real. It's real, yep. Mm -hmm. And the Heart Center for Women is 
great for that purpose. Women feel like they have a community because we have a focus on women's heart health, which many women that make it to our office have, have been ignored. Right. And they've been kind of shoved, you know, their their complaints have been shoved under the rug, like, oh, you have anxiety or you're stressed at home, which is crazy. But we see Well, this lady is stressed at home. I mean, she has all of that. And she also has coronary, <laughs> coronary disease. So it's a little complicated. It so is. having people that are familiar with listening to the story, having a high index of, you know, suspicion and mostly getting funneled into the right treatment groups is really the most important thing. And the, the management thereafter identifying their cardiovascular disease. Women, it is, it's widely known that women are less aggressively treated, not only with intervention, but with the medical therapy after. And I think that um, making sure that we're treating women as aggressively as we treat their male counterparts is really important. And that's something that we don't think about very much. But we need to start, you know, doing the same for both. So how do you get, so if, if they're out in the world, I know that there are these centers that are specialized for women. How do we get the women to the specialized center so that they can be amongst a bunch of providers that are used to treating women who may present differently with an MI or may not have calcifications? How do they get to the center? Well, that's actually, there are several ways you can get there. The THI website, the um, call THI and ask for a doctor hotline. <laughs> so, I mean, we get people who are texting us from states in California, and I forward them to my my male colleagues, to everyone, because well, I can't I can't be all alone doing this. So, <laughs> we treat people over the internet, and we give advice, and some people fly in. We had one fly in yesterday for Dr. Rogers, <laughs> and and he was gone, so we took care of that guy. So. You know, we all work together to um, to elevate what we're doing, and we work collegially. And so, most important thing about a center is a center is a collection of experts. So we have an interactive conversation, which is like what we're doing here. You know, an interventional cardiologist, a non-invasive cardiologist, and a surgeon. We discuss the case and we figure out what's best. And usually, when you have a conversation about the care of the patient, it improves the outcome. Certainly. Yeah, so I, that's the part about medicine I actually really love. Like I love the interaction with the other physicians and the um, inter, you know, interface with the patient. I love that. That's one of the things I love about working at Texas Heart, and I, I love all my colleagues. Yeah. And um, I think it, it elevates what we do, and then it it can transform how we look at research projects and how we take on clinical studies. So, right. yeah. you know, there's a lot of important, you know, cardiovascular trials. So how we participate in those, because we have a finite number of patients and a finite amount of effort to right. spread around. So as a collective, we have to decide what's, what's the most important. So I think that's the next kind of stage that we're looking forward to. Right. And it sounds like uh, the Women's Center being sort of new to the system, for me, it's been, it's an interesting entity because it's not only a place where you can send these women with sort of unicorn disease processes, meaning, you know, there's not so many people with SCAD and, and pregnant people with heart problems is mm -hmm. terrifying on a multitude of levels for most <laughs> physicians, but there's like a home for them. But even more so when I get that call at 2 a.m. and I need help. You can call someone. There's someone who deals in unicorns. Yeah. yeah. And we like to do the yeah. unicorn stuff. Um, pregnant women, that's, I know Dr. Coulter, and, and I love taking care of the pregnant woman, which most people are like, oh, get the pregnant woman out of the <laughs> um, But they're so grateful that someone's comfortable helping them. So I think that. Right. Honestly, we have a rule in the office. If someone calls <laughs> and they, they're pregnant, they just kind of need to be seen ASAP. So they kind of skip the line. That's perfect. Because, well, you know, everyone else is afraid. And they, they're they actually usually really kind of easy to deal with. Yeah. And it's kind of fun for us as cardiologists because, well, we're taking care of older people all the time. So it's really kind of, <laughs> I mean, it's just a different change up of the lineup, you and know? Physiology is different. Yeah, it's great. They're, I'm, like, I have a handheld scanner now. And like, <laughs> Bree, Bree kept, came and got my handheld scanner yesterday. And it's pretty good. And so I just... It makes people feel better if they can see their heart, you yeah. know? So I'll just, it's like a stethoscope to me now. They're pretty cool. So I got some questions uh, for you guys uh, being esteemed panelists. You mentioned clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, when we look at clinical trials, there's consistently been a disparity as far as enrollment mm -hmm. men to women. And can you talk about, um, you know, what those barriers are for clinical trials as far as, you know, we heard about a number of uh, trials that Dr. Valentin just spoke about with, um, you know, non-statin care. Um, I'm in the heart failure realm, and you see a huge disparity there, whereas, you know, as you mentioned, you're taking care of a lot of HEFPEF patients. Mm -hmm. um, what's 90% female, really? Right. So can you talk about, A, the, um, what's the barrier to get these patients into clinical trials, and B, what should be our focus moving forward? How do we get more women into clinical trials? And then C, can you talk about some of the disparities in outcomes um, with, um, you know, um, not only um, coronary disease, but maybe even um, other things like how they do post-bypass right. uh, um, surgery, as well as uh, post-ACS. Mm -hmm. I'll start. That's a lot of questions. So <laughs> I'll see if we can get Let's to them. So uh, one, why are the trials difficult <laughs> to enroll women? And I think it's just been the bias of big centers um, for enrollment. I happen to know that women are more difficult to enroll in clinical trials from personal experience. They're just more cynical and afraid to sign up for it. And just especially for cardiovascular trials where you, you have to make a decision right now. You're having a heart attack. Do you want to take this risky treatment or stay with the regular thing? And, you know, women tend to like want to pontificate a little bit about how they think about what they want to do. So that's a barrier. Two, having people speak to the patient in a, a friendly manner for the female may be part of the bias. Um, I hope that's not still the case, you know? Um, and then just seeing enough women, you know, come through the door. So a lot of women have typically wanted to stay in their local communities where men tended to want to go into town and most of the clinical trials are being run by centers in town. So then that means you have to get into the community. So I'll be, I'll be honest with you, we're participating in a trial for HEFPEF for, um, which is primarily a disease of women, but it's an outpatient trial. So we're kind of hoping that our center will draw them in and we can enroll them right in the office. Um, so that's one way to get around that, that barrier, you know, inpatient versus outpatient you can target your treatment group. And then having people that are interested in it, that are seeing more and more women patients, helping you to funnel patients into clinical trials right. in a meaningful way. And I think one of the others is sort of a, um, a systemic thing that we hadn't really realized. And I think the NIH in the last uh, maybe five years has realized that having women um, in a leadership role in the clinical trials and involved in the trial design for like the multi-arterial grafting study, the cutoff was 75. And since women present a decade later, we weren't even able to enroll a good chunk of the women who actually were like the normal population of females. So in order to have a trial that could actually recruit women, we had to remove an exclusion criteria. And that's just something that no one said, hey, this group of women is all excluded because they present normally later than the trial accepts. So I think putting, having people in centers that are willing to sit on these steering committees and willing to be part of the clinical trials and their design and, and put in that work, I think is changing the way that the trials are rolling out, meaning now I can recruit a 76 year old female because they're more likely to be 76 than they are to be 66. Mm -hmm. So I think in that way, just having a center where people are given uh, support and basically people are making time for me to participate in these clinical trials so that I can look at those things. I can ask those questions. That's an important point what she brings up about the exclusion criteria because quite honestly, that's one of the barriers for women that the exclusion criteria for trials in the past mm -hmm. basically had limits that excluded women. Unnecessarily so. Well, they were know. just designed for the most common presentation, which, which is, is men. Men, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think I think just the scientific community in the last five ten years are sort of keying in that oh we've been preparing for one person and in preparing for this one you know phenotype we have excluded mm -hmm. an entire gender. <laughs> And as far as outcomes, just to kind of touch, I know we're, we're coming to the end here, um, but you know, outcomes, fortunately for cardiovascular disease in general, death mortality amongst men and women has evened out 
which a decade ago was not the case. So I think having heart centers for women, having people that are now aware that women are not, you know, free of disease in the heart and the vascular <laughs> system um, has really um, made a huge difference. And the American Heart Association has had a huge push and we're all aboard the Go Red for Women train. And um, I think we just have to keep moving. And, and, you know, at some point we might surpass, we might have, you know, lower mortality <laughs> than men. Yeah. I think at THI it's been exceptional. Obviously, Dr. Coulter, you've led the way um, and with others here, there's a huge female presence of mm -hmm. cardiovascular physicians. We've tried. And I think that's really helped with mm -hmm. enrollment for clinical trials, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, recognizing that um, from a presentation standpoint, things may be different. And also not being afraid of, you know, smaller vasculature. We recently right. had a, yeah. uh, you know, uh, abstract abstracted to uh, ISHLT that showed less MCS use and uh, oh, yeah. uh, nationally, but that's not the case here. So I think oh, good. Been, you know, pretty exceptional. Um, so I commend everyone for, you know, just an outstanding job, and especially Dr. Coulter for your center of cardiovascular. Thank you. It, it takes a while to change a culture, you know, and so um, there are many ways to do so, but really by just working together and, and being eager, it really can make a difference. Yeah. And not yeah. accepting status quo. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for mm -hmm. pushing the envelope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, a few questions, and can you comment on diet? I'll make it really simple. Yeah. Diet isn't what you give up. Diet is what you eat, okay? <laughs> so eat healthy, okay? It's a choice we make every day. And the main thing is eat as much colorful foods that are real foods as opposed to processed food. Food comes from the earth <laughs> <laughs> and from trees, and it should be colorful. And so if you can eat five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day, avoid red meat and um, eat lean um, white um, meats or fish as much as you can, your diet will be much improved. So I'm a big fan of Mediterranean diet. Um, I'm not, I know this is gonna ring too well. I'm not super excited about too much alcohol and I think the data is really coming down to less alcohol the better. And the Canadians recently published a big um, release about no more than really three drink anything more than three drinks a week is m way too much increases your risk of cancer it just makes you fat <laughs> and insulin resistant and that's not good right and it increases your risk of AFib if you well, have clearly AFib, it makes it way more common so patients don't, don't like to hear that but it's true yeah so I'm really <laughs> kind of very upfront about food is natural and don't try to avoid anything processed and don't don't eat anything white because <laughs> rice, potatoes, chips, tortillas are really just insulin ogenic, right? Well, thanks. And uh, more on that on the website. Yeah, That's there's plenty of different. there's plenty of good topics on the website because people are interested in their food intake. Right. But remember, lifestyle, how you live your life is 60% of your life expectancy quotient. 20% is your doctor. 20% is your is your um, genetic code. So you, we all have a very big role to play in our outcome. Get busy living healthy. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Worst to live by.